Welcome to the Reality Revolution. I'm your host, Brian Scott. Today, we're going to have some fun and we're going to talk about the council. I obviously had a previous episode on the council, but I had made it around a Dolores Cannon excerpt. But the truth is, I talked about a bunch of different sources in that episode. So, we're going to briefly discuss the Dolores Cannon stuff, but we're also going to explore the Council of Nine, and I have further information that I'd love to share. The Council of Nine is a fascinating concept, and I don't know if it's true or not. This is not saying that it's true, but I'm giving you documentation from different channelings and research that talk about the Council of Nine. According to these different entities and channels, the Council of Nine essentially controls the solar system and has put the Earth in a quarantine and controls the quarantine. They are loving and respect the law of one. But there are many different aspects to it. It's about the history of our solar system. So, let me give you some background of what I have found about the history of the solar system as briefly as we can and why the council is doing this quarantine. I have another episode where I talk some channelings from Quo in the Law of One and he discusses that we're in a time lateral. So perhaps the earth is in a segment of time to protect us from outside interference of other aliens or whatever it is. That's the answer to the Fermi's paradox. But what level has the council influenced the earth? You can go down the rabbit hole and watch the David Icke video on Saturn. And the problem with that is he'll take the smallest, most insignificant thing and blow it up. There is some weak links in his arguments if you follow them. He'll bring a bunch of links to things and the links in between what he is saying sometimes do not hold up. So you have to evaluate this yourself. And some of it is difficult to understand or evaluate. He is always filtering everything through a negative, assuming that the, we're being fed on by higher dimensional aliens. I do not think that's what's going on. Maybe look at us more like a garden, but there are certain rules that accompany the council. And I wanted to discuss what the law of one says about the council. So if you were here for that episode before, I may repeat myself just to get this information in. But we're also going to look at the channelings that Ra mentions are accurate, and that is in the book Yuri, which was a book written about Yuri Geller, and it was written by Andrea Puharich. There's also something more mind blowing than that, and that is that Star Trek came from the Council of Nine. A group was channeling the Council of Nine, and there's this book that I found, The Only Planet of Choice. And in it, Gene Roddenberry is taking part in these channelings with the Council of Nine. So it's possible what we're watching with Star Trek is actually what's happening in the real galaxy. Remember, Neville Goddard always says, there's no such thing as fiction. So if they are based in Saturn, Saturn is a very unique planet that people don't talk about. The hexagonal storm that's at the base of Saturn is just weird. And it's got one of the weirdest sounds if you actually listen to the physical sound of Saturn. But it's so beautiful. It's such a beautiful planet. Now the Dolores Cannon material involves a channeling with a member of the council that actually incarnates as a human. And in that one, they are very fearful that the earth will be ended, that a new earth is being created. And they emphasize the importance of not letting fear overcome you. That information is quite interesting, but there is so much more about the council. But we need to look at the history of the solar system as we know it from the law of one and other sources. One interesting source is Dronvalo Melchizedek, who in his book, The Ancient Secret of the Flower of Life, Volumes 1 and 2, talks about the history of the earth. Now, I won't go into details about the beginnings of the human race. He talks about could be a combination of different groups, Sirius and the Anunnaki, which are mentioned in Wingmakers, seem to be consistent with Dronvalo Melchizedek's explanation of the beginnings of 
man. Now, it may not contradict with the secret doctrine, but it seems to be similar to that information. So we could have been just slaves that were tricked into taking human form, and we got caught here like a spider web. And we've been working to try to get out of what happened way back then. But the interesting thing about the planet is, in our solar system, according to Ra, in the channelings called the Law of One, and to briefly explain, if you've never heard of the Law of One, there are a set of channelings from 1981 to 1984 by three people, Carla Ruckert, Don Elkins, and Jim McCarty. And they had one person that was a scribe that wrote down the sessions, one that would ask questions, and one that was completely out. And the information that came out is really mind-blowing, talking about how the universe works, how the solar system works. And I have explored this topic on several episodes including some interviews with Aaron Abke that I recommend. In fact, I think that he is the best teacher of the Law of One right now, so go and check out Aaron Abke's stuff because it's all amazing. So the interesting thing about the history of our particular solar system is we had Venus. Venus is raw, a social memory complex of six and a half density that evolved from a civilization on Venus, and only a third of the planet made it when it moved and shifted into fourth density. That information is not as explicit about what exactly happens when moving into fourth density. The Melchizedek evidence is pretty much devastating as to what happens when you move to fourth density. So I've been piecing together and trying to get as much information as I could. There appears to be conflicting information about the past history. Thoth, who is spoken of in Drunvalo Melchizedek's book is talking from one perspective and the information in the law of one may be slightly different. We may be existing in simultaneous realities that have simultaneous histories and that's why we would hear multiple different versions. But in Melchizedek's explanation a million years ago, Mars was sunny, it had water and there was a group of beings that had developed that were very much like Spock. They showed no emotion. Well, the dark side of that is just constant battles and technology, and they ended up destroying the planet. And a small group of them came to Earth. That is also confirmed in the Law of One, that they destroyed the planet. There's biblical implications because some people imply there's something Luciferian about what happened with Mars. But Mars tries to take over the Earth once it comes here, the small group that comes here, not including the souls from Mars that end up being reincarnated on Earth later as an agreement with the Law of One. But Mars is not able to win its battle against Atlantis. At the time, it would appear that it, there may have been two races on Earth. Atlanteans and Lemurians may have been different. The Lemurians were more of a matriarchal society that was more female aspect and Atlanteans were just a little bit different kind of more of a hybrid and then the Martians were completely masculine aspect so Mars doesn't win against the Atlanteans who have a higher technology and but they agree to live together at some point they continue to try and battle over thousands of years up and down who knows how much of that is infused in our primal sense. But something happens at some point in time and Mars decides to take over the planet by creating a synthetic Merkaba on the planet. Many of the pyramids that are on the Earth may have been built in this operation and they failed, but in the process may have created the Bermuda Triangle according to Melchizedek. When this happens, the parts of the second density, the innards, the way he explains it, it's like if we were to rip our organs open, blood would come out. That's the inner parts of what, how we work. There was a dimensional rip in the earth. It was a huge environmental disaster, worse than any war, but they get through it. And then there's a comet that comes and they have this big argument on earth, whether or not to stop it. The Martians say, we got to stop it. And it ends up destroying most, most of the Martians on the earth at the time. And that's where you get the great flood that happens. And 
much of the earth is wiped out. So what has happened at that point in time is that the solar system and the sun in general has failed. Two planets, remarkably, two planets have essentially destroyed themselves. So they collectively brought the souls from Maldek. That was the planet that's destroyed. And there's very little that I've been able to find about what was going on about Maldek. So if anybody has any resources where they've channeled or learned information about those societies, there's a brief glimpse on a movie called Aliens on Iapetus about the possibilities that the moon of Iapetus was a spaceship that's right next to Saturn. There is a little ridge on it, and it appears that there's perhaps artificial objects so that some remote viewers looked at it and there was grand, huge societies that may have existed on Maldek. So you have all this stuff, but the solar system's been in trouble. The Earth is not doing very well. We've already destroyed in the Earth. The planet has been destroyed. One of the things, there's a distortion that occurred when the, magnet, the magnetosphere, which we turns out is attached to our memory, had collapsed when they did this uh, after the comet and some other things, there was a shift on the planet and everybody forgot their memories. I guess this has been confirmed. And originally when Russians would go into space, they would go crazy over a period of time and they would have a magnetic belt to retain their memories. So there's some tie we have, which we've always thought that our memories are not contained in our minds. So the council comes in and they had originally helped create the solar system. Now, side note, another thing that I, an, an episode I never got to release, Dolores Cannon also talks to a client in regression that is able to go to the library where they have all the information about the history of our solar system. And the solar system was built, all the planets and everything, by a group called the Archaics. Another interesting side note that is very interesting coincidence. In the Dolores Cannon material where they talk about the Archaics, they say that they left Jupiter as a possible second sun. And when they describe all the different planets that are Logos in the solar system, they claim that Jupiter is not one of those Logos, that Jupiter is, a, is the same entity as the sun. So I guess they just left an extra light bulb if we expand outward in our solar system successfully and we go galactic. Is what they said in that particular channeling. But this council, who may be ninth dimensional beings, and I will, we'll see what they're described from a brief discussion of the Law of One material. There's so much that's in this. This is going to be a little bit longer episode, and I apologize for that, but I'm fascinated by it, and I have a feeling that you're going to be fascinated by it as well. Supposedly, this particular quarantine on the Earth protects us and they protect our free will but there is a balance with the law of one they allow the negative entities and the positive entities as a part of this law of one it may be possible that these negative entities have violated our free will and we could always make that argument to the council while the council was first mentioned in other books the best place for us to start is in the law of one or the raw material in the sixth session is the first time that Ra mentions the council saying, in the question, how were you able to make the transition from Venus? And I assume the sixth dimension, which would be invisible when you reached here. Did you have to change your dimensions to walk on the earth? Ra says, you will remember the exercise of the wind. The dissolution into nothingness is the dissolution into unity, for there is no nothingness. From the sixth dimension, we are capable of manipulating by thought the intelligent infinity present in each particle of light or distorted light so that we were able to clothe ourselves in a replica visible in the third density of our mind-body-spirit complexes in the sixth density. We were allowed this experiment by the council which guards this planet. Don Elkins then asks, where is the council located? Ra says this council is located in the octave or eighth dimension of the planet Saturn, taking its place in an area which you would understand in the third dimensional terms as the rings. You can find different places on the internet where people have seen objects in the rings that do not appear to be just parts of the rings. 
in the seventh session don elkins asks at what point would this calling be enough for you to openly come among the people on earth how many entities on earth would have to call the confederation ross says we do not calculate the possibility of coming among your peoples by the numbers of calling but by a consensus among an entire societal memory complex which has become aware of the infinite consciousness of all things this has been possible among your peoples only in isolated instances in the case wherein a social memory complex which is servant of the creator sees this situation and has an idea for the appropriate aid which can only be done among your peoples the social memory complex desiring this project lays it before the council of saturn if it is approved the quarantine is lifted i have a question i believe about the council from jim who are the members and how does the council function ross says the members of the council are representatives from the confederation and from those vibratory levels of your inner planes bearing responsibility for your third density the names are not important because there are no names your mind body spirit complexes request names and so in many cases the vibratory sound complexes which are consonant with the vibratory distortions of each entity are used however the name concept is not part of the council if names are requested we will attempt them however not all have chosen names in number the council that sits in constant session though varying in its members by means of balancing which takes place what you would call regularly is nine that is the session council to back up this council there are 24 entities which offer their services as requested these entities faithfully watch and have been called the guardians the council operates by means of what you call telepathic contact with the oneness or unity of the nine the distortions blending harmoniously so that the law of one prevails with ease when a need for thought is present council retains the distortion complex of this need balancing it as described and then recommends what it considers as appropriate action this includes one the duty of admitting the social memory complexes to the confederation and two offering aid to those who are unsure how to aid the social memory complex requesting aid in a way consonant with both the call the law and the number of those calling that is to say sometimes the resistance of the call three internal questions in the council are determined these are the prominent duties of the council they are if any doubt able to contact the 24 who then offer consensus judgment thinking to the council the council then may reconsider any question question is the council of line the same nine that was mentioned in the book and he gestures with the book uri Ra says the council of nine has been retained in semi undistorted form by two main sources that known in your naming as mark and that known in your naming as henry in one case the channel became the scribe in the other the channel was not the scribe however without the aid of the scribe the energy would not have come to the channel don elkin says i am interested in the application of the law of one as it pertains to free will and what I would call the advertising done by UFO contact with the planet. That is, the council has allowed the quarantine to be lifted many times over the past 30 years. This seems to me a form of advertising for what we are doing right now, so that more people will be awakened. Am I correct? Ross says it will take a certain amount of untangling of conceptualization of your mental complex to reform your query into an appropriate response. Please bear with us. The Council of Saturn has not allowed the breaking of quarantine in the time space continuum you mentioned. There is a certain amount of landing taking place. Some of these landings are of your peoples, some are of the entities known to you as the group of Orion. Secondly, there is a permission granted not to break quarantine by dwelling among you, but to appear in thought form capacity for those who have eyes to see. Thirdly, you are correct in assuming that permission was granted at the time space in which your first nuclear device was developed and used for confederation members to minister until your peoples in such a way as to cause mystery to occur this is what you mean by advertising and it is correct the mystery 
and unknown quality of the occurrences we are allowed to offer have the hoped-for intention of making your peoples aware of infinite possibilities when your peoples grasp infinity. Then, and only then, can the gateway be opened to the law of one. Elkins asks, the way I understand the process of evolution of a planetary population is that a population has a certain amount of time to progress. This is generally divided into three 25,000 year cycles. At the end of 75,000 years, the planet progresses itself. What caused this situation to come about? Preciseness of the years, 25,000 years, etc. What set this up to begin with? Ra says, visualize, if you will, the particular energy which outward flowing and inward coagulating formed the tiny realm of the creation governed by your council of Saturn. Continue seeing the rhythm of this process. The living flow creates a rhythm, which is an inevitable as one of your timepieces. Each of your planetary entities began the first cycle when the energy nexus was able in that environment to support such mind-body experiences. Thus, each of your planetary entities is on a different cyclical schedule, as you might call it. The timing of these cycles is a measurement equal to a portion of intelligent energy. This intelligent energy offers a type of clock. The cycles move as precisely as a clock strikes your hour. Thus, the gateway from intelligent energy to intelligent infinity opens regardless of circumstances on the striking of the hour. So there's a bunch more on the council in there. They do ask, I see the nine describes as the nine principles of God. Can you tell me what they mean by that? And Ross says, this is also a veiled statement. The attempt is made to indicate that the nine who sit upon the council are those representing the creator, the one creator, just as there may be nine witnesses in a courtroom testifying for one defendant. The term principle has this meaning also. The desire of the scribe may be seen in such of the material to have affected the manner of its presentation, just as the abilities and preferences of this group determine the nature of this contact. The difference lies in the facts that we are as we are, thus we may speak as we will or not speak at all. This demands a very tuned, shall we say, group. In the book Yuri about Yuri Geller, it starts out at the beginning with the first contact and says, Somebody in the group, a doctor, that was in the book at the beginning, and the doctor's voice changes and starts saying these things. It wasn't a specific channeling. They didn't call. And they said, we are the nine principles and forces, personalities, if you will, working in complete mutual implication. We are forces. And the nature of our work is to accentuate the positive, the evolutional, and the teleological aspects of existence. By teleology, I do not mean the teleology of human derivation and multidimensional concept of existence. Teleology will be understood in terms of a different ontology. To be simple, we accentuate certain directions as we will fulfill the destiny of creation. We propose to work with you in some essential respects, with the relation of contradiction and contra rarity. We shall negate and revise part of your work by which I mean the work as presented by you. The point is that we begin to begin altogether at a different dimension, though it is true that your work has itself led up to this. I deeply appreciate your dedicatedness to the great cause of peace, which is a fulfillment of finitesimal existences. Peace is not warlessness. Peace is the integral fruitage of personality. We have a design to utilize you and thus to fulfill you. Peace is a process and will be revealed only progressively. You have it in plenty. I mean the patience which is so deeply needed in this magnificent adventure. But today at the moment of our advent, the most eventful and spectacular phase of your work. Puharich, the author, says, It is helpful to have your guidance. We don't guide nor do we seek guidance, the council says, although we appreciate the sense in which you mean it. All of us, including yourselves, can claim no better than being the expressive instruments and avenues of this purpose. Einstein has privately felt the need of con correcting himself. Infinitization of any mass, M, according to him, can be achieved by equating with, and there is a complicated formula, and I only recommend that you check out page 15 of the book. It's M 
to the i equals moc squared with the square root of 1 minus v2 over c2. An implication of this theorem as yet unrevealed will solve the problem of the superconscious. The whole group of concepts has to be revised. The problem of psychokinesis clairvoyance at the present stage is all right but profoundly misleading. Permit us to say the truth. Soon, we will come to basic, universal categories of explicating the superconscious. Just as Jesus said, it is not work but grace. A fruitful, creative approach to the superconscious is indeed a progressive reception of grace. We cannot really go on with the experimentation in this direction, but if we get seven times the electrical equivalent of the human body, if we get it seven times, do you know what would result? It will result in seven on of the mass of electricity. That's a very strange term, but it's true. If it gains sevenfold corresponding approximation to light velocity will be 99%. This is the point where human personality has to be stretched in order to achieve infinitization. This is one of the most secret insights. It's interesting here. They are implying that Einstein had been contacted by the council. In the appendix, they give some additional readings from the Council of Nine, saying that CH is a principle which is the revealing principle of knowledge and law. CH is the principle of timeless knowledge, as revealed through the time process. R is the principle of art and rhythm. M is the principle of human and intimate. The language, the method and logic that belongs to this body or brain that we use, CH presses the buttons and releases the forces. We strive to bring about the required correlation, which is to say, it is an explicit fulfillment of our purpose that we are meeting here tonight. Here is a planned performance, planned to the minutest moment. If the velocity of light is approached to 99%, the increase in the mass is in the range of 7 this is one of the physical proofs of why we want sevens. Perhaps you have not noticed this before. No, I haven't, the author says. That is partly an inference from Einsteinian analysis light velocity. Even there, this seven range, it is not exactly seven, but it's the range of seven. It does not go beyond eight. It doesn't go beyond six. But it hits around seven in such microscopic aspects of velocity. If seven can be so perfectly determined, you will notice why the seven has been detected, even in the physical as well as psycho-spiritual dimensions. The acceptance of the law of seven. Now that's a clue which will keep you absolutely convinced that you will not ask me again, what is the rationale of seven? If we tell you that is the occult number and the seven chords of being as known in ancient occult literature, you will continue to have a veil of suspicion. But now that the increment in the mass is exactly the range of seven by an approximation of 99% to the velocity of light, that is a kind of indicator how mass is related to high velocity. Related in this way, that it achieves an increment of seven achieves an increment in seven, not of seven, beyond 99% we cannot go because it becomes infinitization as you know. The other then asks, may I ask if the formula and its undetected implications implies the discovery of as yet undiscovered energies? The council says no, I must admit one hint, just as there is a time dimension, there is a timeless dimension toward which Einstein is groping, a hint as to the method. The leap is not in the dark, but in the light, which could be taken. Take what I say as a proposition or axiom. The fact of every knowledge experience is timeless, although the act of knowing is in time. To experience knowledge is a timeless experience. We have to discover a formula which will illustrate the correlation between the act of knowing and the knowledge. The spotlight of consciousness is something so tremendous, powerful, this spotlight of consciousness is a sunlight by itself. Do you mean it has growth power of sunlight? Yes, we make it grow, we make it live, we illuminate it. 
you started to elucidate the leap in the dark. Yes, we use the phrase leap in the dark, which is common, but here the leap is in the light because it is expected to take us to an understanding of the super sense. It is light because it is the consciousness problem, not just subconscious or normal conscious inclusive of the superconscious, which is the light per se. Perhaps you can understand this beautiful phrase and then this poem is given. Shadows are receding in a slower rhythm. The song is bursting out of every atom. In the rainbow hues, the multiple one is dissolving itself. The thrill of surprised happiness is coursing through the veins of the earth. The translunar dream is incarnating itself through the bones of the body. A teardrop from the human eye becomes starlight in the darkness of the night. And the silver dew on the cheek of the new morning and itself reappears on the horizon of the human creativeness as an immortal moment of discovery through a series of labor pains in time god is timeless and mart of human aspiration remember all this is real guidance from god god is nobody else than we together the principles the nine principles of god there is no god other than what we are together and just for once in your lifetime believe this is to be the truth if god ever spoke if god ever made an instrument of a human being it is now that he has made it and look upon this as the most precious moment in your lives these are god's words you see the procedure is this we accept the thesis that we are here and that we want these things done we can do them through you you also have to struggle we also have to struggle supposing all healthy biological currents surround the birth of a child it will take nine months and it will take mating the greatest of men were not born in an instant all the birth pangs that any mother would undergo their mother had to undergo too but the point is this supposing tonight i sit down here which is perfectly possible i can sit here for one hour and tell you what is going to happen in the minutest detail how often you're going to sneeze how often you will sit that can be done but it is not the way to do it what you are doing is the right thing struggling a little getting creative imagination into exertion awaiting a certain little point of guidance we are satisfied that every step is being taken in intense sincerity failure and success is in your hands but we also have to do these things you have to do them we have to do them putting up the very best effort in intense sincerity if it's so pleasant to be deluded and to be surprised and to be flabbergasted all these things are very pleasant and necessary but if we were not pleased and detected you were making enormous mistakes and errors we would have told you before we have to look at this as a long-term contract between you and us your cooperation is so urgently needed if we develop these t techniques we shall take long strides because we can do is just this much indicate the formula and the method but we understand how much labor application patience it involves to get into operative focus we have full realization of how much you have to work so our plans are definite we feel that you must put in some real effort we shall cooperate but your will has to exert itself on a long-term basis together we shall achieve some wonders so go in full trust and full hope towards us and more towards yourself that these things definitely come out and no matter what other things happen they will only help the cause the major aspect of this type of work which you have felt already for several years and you have a ripe view of it although you may not perhaps feel so but if you begin to think idea it and put it down you will produce something remarkably valuable so go ahead and do that as quickly as possible but if you've been groping toward some real certainty was that there must be parapsychological dimension that can throw definite floodlights on the new horizons of science yes that is the idea i started out with some time ago we know that 
That is what we have proved to you, perhaps for the first time, in a manifold, simple, lucid, and condensing manner. In case you have questions in reference to this mantric method, the certainty of the presence of which you had already known, you had known there must be a way of parapsychological way which can lead us to wider horizons of science. And if parapsychological knowledge will not help that way, what good on earth is it? Parapsychology, if you want to accept it as a science, has to be impersonal. It has to be methodological. It has to achieve an increment in human knowledge. It has to give really the right lead to the present human mind. In another portion, he asks, is the atom bomb a real threat to the world peace? In the sense in which you have just described, it doesn't seem to be a threat at all should you choose to deflect its energies or silence its energies. The council says, I think I must tell you this, that it's not going to happen. The world is not going to be allowed to be atomized. The fear is there. The threat is there. Human nature is so wretched today. But on the other hand, human nature is so beautiful also, so sacrificing, so understanding. What we really have to fear is not only the fear itself, but the tendency to regiment. That's why the Russian approach to world problems is not acceptable to the scheme of things to ourselves. For instance, because it regiments, there is an element of regimentation in all evolutionary processes. But it is the degree that is unfortunate over there in Russia. Regimentation that insults human will that we cannot ever associate ourselves with. But everything else we don't mind, so precisely our plan is set. In our scheme, we also go on experimenting. We have to experiment in a sense that we never force any will that we get. The wills of humans have to lend themselves. In that lies their growth and maturation. We go to the limit of persuasion, but there we have to stop. Our persuasion is quite often very effective, but we must notice the limit. If it is resistive, we just leave it alone. We don't force in our scheme of things these forces, principles, and personalities. We have to get them into direct service to mankind. We appreciate the desire in you to catalyze this power for serving the man. We have no access to the human world. We have no manufactured this body Vinod for our work, atom by atom. We have to get it to travel across fantastic spaces, but lest we get confused, there is one thing which we slightly hinted at yesterday, which is this. The sort of teleology which is active in this work is not exactly the human purpose way. It is like the implications of laws. It is teleology in a mysterious sense. Though M and CH are responsible for the idea that you got it, it is not to say that you had nothing to do with it. We are terribly happy to note your attitude. We also are very discriminate. We are not putting an idea on barren rock. Our side of the problem is very pathetic. If you will permit me that word, we don't come across wills, points, foci. Without offending their freedom, we could do our work. It is not easy. As we reported to you, you can achieve an extraordinary amount of conditioning, but we cannot plant a foreign urge to anyone. That is the way evolution works in regarding the wills of individuals. Unless that is done, there is no growth. If I act for you, if I sort of give you dates or give you money by precipitation, that can't be done. You don't do anything. It is we who do it. We don't want to do that thing. All that has to be done is really by you. Although very strange occasions arise when you rightly feel that there is not the guidance in this crucial anxiety or blank wall against or impasse or financial stress absence of human cooperation. If the help didn't come from us in these hours, what good is it? Sometimes it is very clearly felt and we don't blame, but the tragedy is shared by us. Around the 11th or 12th hour of the night, if the richest person around us wanted instantaneously $5, he can't get it from the bank. All that could be done is to wait until 9 o'clock in the morning. That is what happens with us with far more precision, because he or she can go to the phone and borrow money. We can't borrow human wills. 
we can't borrow evolutionary processes, impulsions, and we accept these limitations for the fulfillment of the law. It's not that we can't overcome them. What is the sense of the law, the sense of gravitation, if now the table has this times the weight and five minutes later, 20 times over, the gravitation law itself gets frustrated. So the laws which we have set in operation, which we illustrate throughout, they might not be offended, but you might. If you care for a little phrase from us, delays are not denials. Patience, that's all. In all great adventures of ideas, the only prayer which we can address to God is grant me patience, because God will work to give you the fruits for that you need, not ask. What is the meaning of sense? Unless we understand the import of sense itself, the super sense will not be intelligible to us. And since we have to formulate a basic ideology for our work over here, it is important for us to get a glimpse into the real meaning of sense itself. Related words are absence and nonsense. Nonsense really means sense out of reference. Absence or the out of sense, away sense has a reality. But there too the emphasis is on normal elements. Super sense is the discovery of the fullness of sense, of the full stature of sense. The important point is this that two words of sense and super sense are in no way divided. There is a continuous spectrum. If sense and super sense were two different worlds, there would not be that real flow between the two. It's not crossing the border because the borders do not exist. It is just a rising on the scale, the capacity to react, that is the feature or characteristic mark of sense. If this were absent, the super sense of the infinite in self will never be realized by sense. That is the purpose of evolution. Now coming to understand the exact meaning of sense itself, it really is the capacity to react. Even physical objects have that capacity of reacting. But the apparent distinction that could be made is that when you sense reacts, it has the feeling and experience and knowledge of having the reaction. The whole growth of our nature lies in this, to know how to react and to be wakeful at the moment of performance. Does this imply conscious awareness of knowing, he asks. Self-knowledge, if you like. This piece of knowledge is described as reflective knowledge. That is to know that we know knowledge is a sense. It is never handmade. If this is grabbed, it could be clear why super sense, which is supreme knowing, is itself present in all acts and facts. I have manufactured a word. I will call it subsistentiality. Subsistence, the physics of super sense, just as there are laws of sense, there are also laws of the super sense. An aspect of human consciousness is to produce the pair of the sense and the super sense. It must evidently approach something like the nucleus of the atom, the matrix of the high velocities, the equations. The sense of life of a master symbolizes the unity of the integer and the analogy in pair production in the electron and positron as resultants of the annihilated individualization. The author then asks, would that be pre-conscious individuation or highly conscious individuation? The whole gamut of individuations pre all the way to highly intellectualized level where it is annihilated. In masters' lives, we have every sense alert, responsive, even enjoying, but it functions from a different plexus, and the peculiar result being that it leaves no trace of sanskar or karmic latency. It creates no seeds of further repetition of the will act. That is the secret of released action. All of us have to learn that. To some extent, we have to know it. You have known it. Quite a few of us have known it. Peaceful action, action without passion. This is not self-expression as some of your modern educationists have thought it to be, because the so-called self-expression is a process of manifesting the dominant needs or instinct. 
in a masterly conduct. There is no self-expression unless you capitalize the S and make self into infinite self. But there is no point in calling it self-expression because there's only one way to do it and all masters will do it the same way. So one master's self-expression for practical purposes, what is the use of this particular principle? When we act, let us act in terms of not our self-expressing urges, not even in terms of our so-called ideals, but in terms of infinite peace. Infinite, which is the same as peace. But how to do that? Is it just words? No. When we are inspired by peace, our actions are not limited to our own personal aspirations or fulfillments. They are as the terms in a process which lifts into action. For instance, when we let the law find itself through our thoughts, words, and actions, we act in terms of peace, as inspired by the infinite. How to discover the law? Do we get to it by an analysis of the situation, by an understanding of the causes and reason? No. Emphatic no. Though by all means these do supply a guiding light on lesser levels of action. We can know the law if an inner tranquility is presented towards its reception. So the process is one of silencing yourself, the exact opposite of endless thirst for articulation, to which we are so vulgarly bound. It is not, therefore, the education but tranquilization that we should keep in view, a withdrawal, a sanctifying silence, an exposure rather than an education. That is the secret. We who are dedicated to such, I mean you and we who are dedicated to the law, we must practice this masterly way of life. The author asks, does that mean that if we find tranquility, we automatically open the way to the law? What is the first step to remove through every situation in life with equanimity and tranquility? Right. The council says, achievement of exposure. You see, we attribute motives to others in terms of our own personal lives. Most often, this is ludicrously unjust, and the one who suffers is just ourselves. Because if I slap the ground, suspecting a scorpion which is not there, it's my hand that is going to hurt itself. Most philosophy is like that. Famously, it is the search for the black cat in the dark room which is not there. We do not need symbols of law, but let them be symbols and not concepts. For instance, in a tranquilizing attempt, let us use symbols like the nines or the liberated consciousness of mankind. That's all that matters. With us, nothing else does. Then we will tranquilize. But if you put more successes in doing this or that, one thing, they never come about Second, even if they come, they are concealed failures. And thirdly, they lead us into new shapes of success, an eternal maze, an ever-receding horizon. How to clean a muddy pool of water. A challengeful problem. You can throw in some chemical. You can wash the water with waters. You can strain it. But you know, the simplest and most scientific way, leave it alone and the dirt will sink to the bottom don't fight with your mind leave it alone then it will reflect law the full orbed light of law this is not difficult there are not just words all of you have known this as a matter of fact but we have to make it the one law of our life there's some more but you have to agree that a lot of that didn't make sense the questions didn't make sense it was disorganized but there are some hints about the one law. So I'm not sure. Ross says that was accurate, but that's fine. They give some equations. So I didn't find it that appealing. Now, I found something even more interesting. When you look at Star Trek, you see a lot of similarities with stuff that's discussed in the law of one. There's a federation, and it turns out that Gene Roddenberry participated in channelings of the Council of Nine. And Star Trek may be based on the information from these channelings. So there's a book that you can get called The Only Planet of Choice, which is a collection of channelings from someone named Tom who's that who is channeling the Council of Nine. Or 
the Elohim. So the Elohim may be the Council of Nine. The Elohim is mentioned by Neville Goddard. And perhaps we are a portion of each of the nine. That that's perhaps there's nine higher selves. That's a possibility that we all are multidimensional aspects of only nine individuals. I'm not sure if that's true, but that would be another interesting twist. But in the excerpts I can give you from the book, in one portion, Gene Roddenberry says, in a way, the enterprise and the optimistic future in which it exists might be thought of as a reminder of what we can achieve if we really try. In one article I found, it says that the Council of Nine Tribunal Teachers governing our immediate supergalactic and galactic regions subject to change in evolving new programs of the Father's Kingdom. It has been alluded to from other sources that Roddenberry has been a commander or received his inspiration from sitting in on channeling sessions. In the book on pages 95 through 99, Gene Roddenberry asks the channeler a question. Gene says, there's a question that I cannot avoid asking. Why do you not give strong and definitive signs of your existence or proximity on top of approaching humanity by indirect means such as these channelings or other ways? Obviously, you have real reasons, but this question does matter to me. The council says, it is of great importance for you to understand that your governments of your world, of Earth, have refused to publicly believe or convey to the people our existence. If there were an attempt by civilizations to land upon planet Earth in a mass situation, which in truth will come to pass in the course of time, the people upon planet Earth would panic, for they have not the understanding, the knowledge, that we would not mean any harm to them. It is important there is no panic amongst those that exist on the planet Earth, that the knowledge be brought to them in gentleness, that those of the 24 civilizations mean no harm to them. This is of great importance, for if there were panic, humans may then attempt to end their own life, and also the lives of their families and neighbors, which would not serve any purpose. The governments of your world have refused to accept publicity, that there are others of a higher intelligence, and in truth, of a more spiritual intelligence than those that exist upon the planet Earth. We need to convey to the people that there are others that mean them no harm, but have an interest in saving planet Earth. We do not come to control. We do not come to hold in bondage. We will come with love and patience and understanding. But since there is the denial of our existence, how can those of planet Earth accept that the civilizations of Altea, Huva, Ashan, and the rest of the 24 mean well? Jean Roddenberry then asks, I have another question that I think people will wonder about. On previous tapes of your conversations, I heard you explain that you constantly know the thoughts of others, either all of us or those who you communicate with. Am I correct in this assumption? If we have the wish to help you, yes. But we wish you to understand that we do not invade the mind. We do not control the will. We do not interfere with freedom. We do not interfere. It would not be of service. They may have the abilities within them, but it would not benefit planet Earth to use them, nor would it benefit them would it be an evasion of a soul. Roddenberry asks, I have been most impressed by the communications, the expressions, and atmosphere that surround all the people here, but I do have some difficulties in understanding why, if you are in the minds of humans at times and your representatives have visited Earth, and you have a knowledge of human affairs, I find it difficult to understand how you are difficulty speaking with us and understanding our basic colloquial English. Could you help me with that? They explain, We will explain that. The civilizations have indeed visited Earth. But do you understand that when you have communication with your mind, it is not necessary to have words? It is difficult from where we are to give explanations in your words. We have concepts that cannot be explained in your language, for you do not have the words to explain. If you could read our mind, if we could communicate with your mind in the essence of pure telepathy, then we could convey to you that we are trying to transmit. Roddenberry says, thank you. You mentioned at some stage there might be a large-scale landing of the civilizations. I think the next question involves who and where, how and why. The first such question most people would ask is how. In other words, 
what method of transportation would be used in such a landing are we referring to physical vehicles they say yes they would be a in the nature of a physical vehicle if you have the desire to go and touch it as you have with an automobile you would ha be able to touch it can you tell me anything about the relative size and shape and so on will they hold a large number of people on it the council explains there would be vehicles of different sizes and different designs there would be some with the appearance of glass top but it is not in truth a top it will just have an appearance there will also be those that will remain in your atmosphere that are very large and they will send out smaller ones you have upon your oceans carriers that send out ships that fly is that not so that is correct it would be similar but instead of being upon your oceans it will be in your sky roddenberry says so you're saying the smaller craft will exit come down to earth from this carrier craft yes there will also be those that have the appearance of what you call saucers there will be those that are pointed as with a v roddenberry says will those vehicles pass through the time dimension or another dimension in order to arrive here at earth the council says the intelligences that exist in civilizations have the ability to come into your dimension they have the technology yes roddenberry asks a very common earth question would be how these vehicles are powered by what method Tom says it resembles the reversal of a spinning top. If you have checked out the Merkaba meditation or the discussion of Drunvalu Melchizedek's Merkaba, the idea of a spinning top is very coincidental. Robin Berry then asks, would these vehicles remain on Earth after such a landing, and would humans be permitted to inspect them? They would have permission to visit the interior, the council says. The craft would remain for a period of time, not a great length of time, not for years, for example. Roddenberry then says, because of many stories we have of flying saucers, people will be interested to know if humans would be permitted to travel in any of those vehicles. The council says it would be necessary before they could travel in a vehicle to have a vehicle around them. <laughs> Roddenberry says, does this mean that the atmosphere within your vehicles will be different or that the stress of the movement would be dangerous so this implies the vehicle could be the merkaba and tom says the stress of the movement it would be possible to move within your earth atmosphere but to take them out would require another vehicle inside a vehicle but it could be done roddenberry asked landings would undoubtedly be judged by humans and governments in a variety of ways which includes the almost certainty that some would view your landings as a threat do you have a method of defending yourself from attack the council says we wish you to know that we are talking about civilizations not us the council of nine we do not need to manifest in the physical there would be a method to stop people from attempting to destroy those of the civilizations it would be done in love and gentleness those of the civilizations that are in service to us will not attempt to destroy more harm in any manner any physical being on planet earth we will have a way of preventing them from attempting to destroy us but we would wish not to come without giving some prior knowledge for otherwise people would begin to believe that we would seek to control them we have not the desire nor the need to control we come only to benefit if an altian were to appear at the entrance of his vehicle and were stepping onto planet earth and if there were a group that attempted to destroy the altian he has only to hold his hand in an upright manner and not in a great extension to bring calmness and also to render them in a state in which they would not have the desire to harm and would put down their weapons Hoovids would operate in a different manner if they were in the same situation and they came out and their raised their arms these humans with weapons would become totally stationary for a period of time so there are different methods but none of these methods would harm the physical being do you understand roddenberry says yes i understand and i certainly understand why you would not want to land showing force because this would create great fear so that is the extent of the channeling with the council of nine and gene roddenberry if i was going to clickbait this particular episode i would say is star trek from the council of nine and perhaps it is 
well, maybe I'll do that. <laughs> we'll see. But there is another source that I recommend that talks about the council, and that's Downloads from the Nine by Matthias Fleury. And it's a very good book, which has additional channelings from the Nine. Now, whenever I did the council episode before, I got many comments about particular YouTubers that claim to count to channel the nine and they very well, but I'm only going with the ones that I personally find to be somewhat reputable, but I don't know. Maybe they are. I would hope that the council of nine is channeling with as many people as possible, but there is one in particular, one little passage from the book downloads of the nine that I wanted to read that uh, pretty much just blew me away and they say the source of radiant essence with nine multicolored light emanations made the DNA's double helix rotate at immeasurable speeds creating a magnetic field interconnected with three-dimensional star like light this connectivity was permanent and everlasting the fate of mankind is attached to this union this alliance is the central reason why there is duplication in the DNA RNA composed by building blocks that exist in interstellar space. In our biosphere, this duplication also occurs, but it is less dynamic. The DNA RNA synthesis in chromosomal growth was instigated by Arcturian beings through radiant cylindrical coils, establishing an angular frequency and a radial frequency of dynamic geometric codes. This began the chain reaction that caused spontaneous replication connected to the source of radiant essence. Proline, tryptophan, glutamine, asparagine, leucine, methionine, serine, alanine, glycine, and other amino acids were added in order to recalibrate the damaged DNA structure, causing a permutation within the structural vibration code that governs the electromagnetic spectrum. Breathing plays an important role because it bathes these chromosomal codes in light and encourages them with messages of life and joy. You can confirm our statement by observing the hemoglobin molecule. It shows the development of life in itself and provides proof of our assertion. When the darkness did not know is that although dark ink was injected into the cell's nucleus, it failed to stain life. Since life is light, and the human being is a living, refulgent being. Upon mankind's first inhalation of divine air, its biological structure was realigned with the sun's light. In this way, the universal codes that give life substance to soul, mind, and body begin to activate each and every cell. These begin to beat and breathe as the light of unconditional love embrace them with its cosmic vibrations of celestial, three-dimensional architecture. Life began with light, and it shall end with light. The configurations designed by the source of radiant essence for the purpose of evolution were in many cases sabotaged through time and space by the forces of darkness. The shadow and its spawn rejected the human creation from the very beginning. Hatred and envy invaded their hearts due to the capacity of the human soul possesses for the power of transcending the opposing forces along with the nine dimensions from this lower three-dimensional reality, which is constantly transmuting space and time. The nebula keeps hurting the predestined evolution with no regrets or reason. Due to this incomprehensible and unnecessary quarrel, we are obliged to fight. The restructuration of some human bodies has been planned in the fifth dimension so that there is less intervention and opposition from the darkness. It is not necessary to recapitulate our words, but it is necessary to evaluate our possibility to avoid that painful fifth dimension restructuring, which is painful because the human soul will have to be purified with fiery white radiation before they are reinserted into a new restructured human body. These printed words will guide and help you to escape the cleansing so that you might ascend to the higher realms with an intact consciousness make your astral body vibrate now in higher decibels do not wait for the fifth dimensional reformation you should be able to activate the ascending spiral asuntara 
with the help that we offer in day and night in conjunction with the reading and listening to this book. Relax and let this energy climb your spinal column and reach your brain. Allow also a new galactic spiral to open the heart and codify your spirit with vibratory codes from the serene areas of the silent corners of infinity. Relax and let this vortex of light in your heart increase the dynamism of the structural chemical complexion. Those who volunteer to wake up before the restructuring will be awarded with the help of all the nine shining ones and will be able to access all dimensions without pain or without dying the psychological death. Such an awakening will help to reorganize the streamlining of the undulating patterns of luminous energy that are modulated to delineate the final design of the future human body. The nine divas are in the present moment trying to adapt your body as you read or listen to different oscillating vibrations without any centralization, where space-time ripples don't have to arrange with specific electromagnetic frequency. This can be done here and now or in parallel dimensions without continuous or sequential time. The reprogramming of the biological structure goes hand in hand with the astral causal rearrangement that takes place with photonic radiations of three-dimensional symmetric content. Then there is a very interesting passage where they say, The virus of the densest shadow will succumb. The codes containing viruses will be intercepted with oscillating codes from all dimensions forming an energetic and oral structure of brilliant geometric radionic twirls. The new human being will reach unimaginable horizons and will cross the barrier that separates him from the intergalactic civilizations. If you are hearing this, know that you can be a humble master and we will help you with everything so your spirit spreads beyond limits. Help us accomplish this transformation and make you a crystalline master of celestial light, permanently exonerated from egocentric forces. Aid us in giving you 49 bodies so that you may access all nine dimensions simultaneously, as in the past, and have a glimpse of the source of radiant essence without being disintegrated. Transcend the coexisting worlds and the biochemical frontiers leave the past and heavy pride behind fly very very high what we say is not about exploring new intergalactic horizons or dimensions even though this is bound to happen what we want for you is the highest and nothing else what we wish for you is as simple as transcending this dimension and consequently the others we will teach you to defeat the gravitational forces of the tremendous masses of neutrons that are encapsulating you in this third dimension. For now, forgive yourself, bow your egotistical head, and ask all for forgiveness. In this way, your individual eye sense will begin to gradually dissolve until it is left in oblivion. Relax and let us realign your atomic and molecular structure with the purpose of making it twirl in parallel planes so that in this way, in the external levels, the complementary particles that are compressing it will spontaneously expand with the crystalline light of the loving heart. The plan, something immensely marvelous, is about to happen. The source of radiant essence has finally been able to understand the darkness through human beings. Even though they have suffered sabotage after sabotage, their purpose has been accomplished. Although the darkness appears to expand infinitely, it is circumscribed and therefore limited by time and space. The source of radiant essence is very close to penetrating the densest nebula, but first it will perform an amazing miracle. It will transcend the nine dimensions for the first time without losing its dreamed identity. Usually when a being wakes up within a dream, it realizes that it is not what it believed itself to be, and that is nothing more and nothing less than the absolute consciousness that for some strange reason started dreaming itself. During the awakened process, the individual disappears. Its identity 
dies and the mental conceptualization sinks into an ocean of tight and eternal joy. The individual merges with absolute consciousness. The drop of water returns to the ocean of peace in stillness. Conversely, the source of radiant essence that understands the dream and is already merged yet as the same time has its own omniscient, omnipresent, and prevailing identity will magically penetrate absolute consciousness, the purpose of illuminating specific areas with photons of the third dimension, light of 010001 in the fourth, radiant light of 011001 from the fifth dimension, beaming light of 001100 of the sixth dimension, incandescent light of 000110 from the seventh dimension, uncompressed light of 001001 of the eighth dimension, and the 000111 of the ninth, the most powerful existing light of the multidimensional dream. The dream will be used with the purpose of modifying the prevailing reality, and for the first time the dream will conquer the dreamer. What we are saying here is contradictory. We also need to believe in the impossibility of getting out of the divine dream and continuing with individualized consciousness. But the source of radiant essence is going to show the opposite. I have no doubt whatsoever that if the source of radiant essence has planned it, that it's possible and the nebula with all its suffering will disappear from the face of the nine-dimensional dream. Please know that we are trying to explain an unexplainable unapproachable and not comprehensible in terms of three-dimensional mind of the being. What we are doing here is only an attempt to satisfy the mental hunger experienced in this dimension with three-dimensional mental concepts. Once the source of radiant essence finishes its work in the absolute conscious planes, it will penetrate the dream and will be able to trespass the gloomiest and densest borders. I have one commenter that comes on my videos and I think his name's Adam. So what's up Adam if you're listening, who has said that the council disappeared and the council doesn't exist anymore. I'm not sure about that. I do recommend you read the download of the nines or from the nines by Matthias Fleury. I think that you'll get a lot out of it after understanding the council. So is the council just a myth that's been carried down? through the ages and that's certainly a possibility it's become an archetype on some level and maybe these are different channelings of different councils it's possible that the council that's talked about in Dolores Cannon is a different council but the discussion of it is very fascinating and I have no idea what to think clearly something more is going on in the universe than what we think in our small little minds and if there is information, I like to explore it. It does not necessarily mean that I believe it, but I would love to get your impressions of it. I could really go into even more detail, but I think that's a good stopping point. It's fun to discuss. It's fun to think about. Is that hexagonal storm inside of Saturn a spinning Merkaba? Is the nine talking about the spinning Merkaba? Spinning Merkaba is talked about here and implied a couple of times. There's a lot here that I don't understand. And there's a lot here that very easily could just be wrong. So I would love to use the comments as a discussion of this. Please subscribe to the channel. I have daily content and we cover all kinds of interesting topics from new thought authors to advanced concepts in creation and we're always exploring all of these episodes are explorations in the current reality revolution which we're going through right now and all i'm attempting to do is just be a narrator on the forefront of this revolution in this time that i'm incarnated to help it to propel it in whatever way that i can i know a lot of that was confusing and you probably dropped out during the middle of those channelings. 
If you stuck your way all the way to the end of this one, I greatly appreciate it. It was a personal quest to understand the Council. All episodes of The Reality Revolution can be found at TheRealityRevolution.com And Saturn, if you're listening, welcome to The Reality Revolution.